All right, let's get started. Well, several years ago, um, I debated Bart Ehrman, the, uh, perhaps the most influential, skeptical New Testament scholar in North America. And we debated on the resurrection of Jesus, and one of the objections he brought up had to do with contradictions in the Gospels. And as we were discussing these during the debate, I said, hey, you know, I've brought up or built my case on the historical, uh, or the historicity of the resurrection, uh, not on the inerrancy or even the general trustworthiness of the New Testament literature. I've done this uh, using strictly controlled historical method based on things that we can know with a very high degree of historical certainty. So even if the Gospels have contradictions, it doesn't do anything to undermine my case. Um, now, and, and, that's the, and that is the truth. When I was teaching a course uh, sometime later on uh, the resurrection, there was a girl in the class that at the very end, she said, but these contradictions, these alleged contradictions or, or discrepancies in the Gospels, they really trouble me. And so how, what can we do with these? And, and she was getting kind of emotional. You could tell it, it just really bothered her. And so this was something that I started working on over time. I started reading the Gospels. I was reading through them in Greek several times. And the reason being is because, you know, a lot of us who have been Christians for a while, we've read through the New Testament literature so many times that we start reading it and, we're, and we can just glance over it and it, it just doesn't sink in because it's just so familiar to us. So in order to eliminate that, I started reading them in the original language and reading through them several times. And as I did this, I just saw all sorts of differences that came to mind that I didn't see before. In fact, over the last couple years, I've compiled a list of about 40 pages of differences among the Gospels when you, when you read them side by side. Now, many attempts to reconcile the differences that we find in the Gospels um, are harmonization attempts. And in many cases, the harmonization attempts work very well. But sometimes, harmonization attempts end up being no more than a sort of hermeneutical waterboarding uh, that we subject the text to until it tells us what we want to hear. And this is just something that really has turned me off over time, that, that kind of um, an, an exercise, because it doesn't do any justice uh, and respect for the scriptures. And so I started thinking, well, maybe there's a, a better avenue in terms of, of trying to account for some of these differences. Let's look at these in an objective sense. Let's try to find some really good, authentic answers um, that we can arrive at. And so I started studying the Bibles as ancient biographies. And this is something that scholars have begun to, uh, well, since the 1970s, they've begun to posit. And then in 1992, there was a book out by Richard Burridge, What Are the Gospels? And it's been extremely influential in the world of New Testament scholarship to now perhaps a majority of New Testament scholars, including evangelical scholars, regard the Gospels to be, uh, belong to the genre or literary style of ancient biography of the Greco-Roman type. Now, Greco-Roman rather than Jewish biography is because in, the, in Jesus' day, there were no Jewish biographies. They didn't write biographies of the rab their rabbis. And they've done all sorts of linguistic analyses and things in terms of the length of biographies and how many times the subject appears in it can, uh, compared to ancient um, history. And not that biography wasn't history, but it's a different genre. Um, and so how did ancient biography work? And so reading about this and then reading, I'm, I've been reading through the ancient biographies. There's like 70 or 80 of them around the time of Jesus that would be relevant to him. And understanding that ancient biography isn't necessarily the same kind of, of literature as modern biography. And sometimes what we do is we want to judge the Gospels according to 21st century biography and how they, mit, uh, how they uh, uh, compare or follow the literary conventions of modern biography rather than what we're looking at at the first century. Now with that introduction, what I want to do is I, I, I want to investigate and, and come up with an approach here to how we would uh, account for some of these differences within the Gospels, how they differ from one another, and, and do this in an honest way. Robert Funk, the late Robert Funk, a co-founder of the Jesus Seminar, talks about how the four accounts, the Gospels, the resurrection and narratives in the Gospels are hopelessly at variance. 
Willy Marxen, uh, a German liberal uh, New Testament scholar, says a harmonizing of these different, pre differing presentations is not possible. They say, yeah, but that's Robert Funk of the Jesus Seminar, that's Willy Marxen. I mean, come on, these are, are liberal scholars, of course they're gonna say something like that. What about a, a, a more conservative scholar? Well, how about N.T. Wright? How would he do for you? He talks about the obvious apparent surface inconsistencies in the Gospels. And Paul Meyer, distinguished professor of ancient history at Western Michigan University, a very conservative Christian scholar, says it is of no service, it is no service either to Christianity or to honesty to gloss over these discrepancies in the Gospels, or as is incredibly done in some circles, to deny that they exist. Now I have to admit, several years ago, I was, my very first debate was with Dan Barker at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And he brought up a bunch of differences in the resurrection narratives. He says, don't you think they contradict one another? And I said, no, I, I don't think they do. Now I'd studied some about these differences in the gospels and the harmonization attempts, but I hadn't really looked at them. And then as I did, uh, went more and more into my uh, doctoral research, I, I was reading through the burial and resurrection narratives in the gospels in Greek 35 times. And as I was doing this, all of a sudden more different of these differences in the gospel started to stand out to me and I started to realize there are some things that just don't harmonize as well um, when you subject them to harmonization efforts. So here I wanna to present to you three essential issues for understanding differences in the gospels. Number one, the first thing we wanna do is look at it and determine whether we are looking at a, conf a contradiction or a difference. Now let me explain. Back in 1912, when the Titanic sank, there were conflicting eyewitness testimonies. Some of the witnesses said that the Titanic broke in half and then sank. Others said, uh-uh, she went down in one piece. Now how do you get that wrong? I mean, here you are in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, it's the most terrifying night of your life. You're out there in this lifeboat, and there's only one thing really that you can see in front of you, and it's this big thing, it's about 800 and some feet long, it's all lit up and people are screaming coming from, you know, you hear screams coming from it. How do you get it messed up that it breaks in two and then sinks, or nah, -uh, it went down in one piece? Well, I don't know, but both of their testimonies are contradictory, there is no way of harmonizing them. It either broke in half and sank, or it didn't. These are contradictions. That's, that's a contradiction. A difference on the other hand, let's say I go home, now I'll be going home Tuesday, returning to Atlanta area where I live, and let's say I come in at night uh, to the front door and my wife says, Mike, got great news for you. And what happened was about an hour ago, the doorbell rang and I came down to the front door and there's this guy standing there with this big check for $15 million. And he says, you've just won Publishers Clearinghouse. Boy, that'd be good news. <laughs> and so then, so that's fantastic. Well, half an hour later, I hear my wife talking to her mom, and she says, you won't believe what just happened. I can't, the doorbell rang, I came downstairs, and there's two guys at the front door, and one's got this check for $15 million, and this other guy's videotaping, and says, you've just won Publishers Clearinghouse, congratulations. Now she gets off the phone, and I say, you just contradicted yourself. Well, what do you mean? Well, you said there was just one guy at the door and he's the guy talking. Well, I didn't say there was just one. I just mentioned that guy because I wanted to tell you quickly and summarize it up. I didn't want to go into all the details. And I just told you about this one guy and I had him talking, but it was actually the guy videotaping and there were two of them. And the guy videotaping is the one that said that to me. It's not a contradiction, it's a difference for, for the context. Let me show you a couple examples of these in the Gospels. How many women went to the tomb? This is something that Ehrman and many other skeptics will bring up. How many w w went to the tomb? The synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, say that there were multiple women, whereas you come to the gospel of John, it says Mary got up early in the morning while it was still dark and went to the tomb and, and, and found it empty. So which one is it? Were there multiple women or were there just one? Well, what's really interesting here is when you read John chapter 20, verses one and two, it says early in the morning while it was still dark, after the Sabbath, uh, Mary got up, went to the tomb, and found it empty, and so she came back, verse two, she ran back to the 
and said to Peter and the beloved disciple, they have taken the Lord and we don't know where they've laid him. We? Who's we? Well, maybe that's Peter and the beloved disciple and Mary, maybe that's, well, maybe, or maybe she's speaking for others. Are there any other examples of this? I'm glad you asked, because in fact there is. When you go to Luke chapter 24, it's uh, really interesting. Who ran to the tomb after the women reported it? Well, according to um, John, it says that Peter and the beloved disciple got up when Mary said this, and they ran to the tomb, and they found it just like Mary said, and then they both went home. But when you read the story in Luke, when the women came back and said, they've, take, uh, you know, they've, they've taken the Lord, uh, the tombs, or no, they don't say that, the tomb is empty, we saw some angels, and it says Peter got up and ran to the tomb and found it just like the women had said, and then he went home. Well, wait a minute, that just said just Peter. No, it didn't say just Peter. It just mentions Peter. What's really interesting is 12 verses later what Luke reports. In that case, now it's the Emmaus disciples. They're walking along the road. Jesus uh, uh, joins them, and it says their eyes were kept from recognizing him. So uh, the more I've, I read this text, the more I just start to laugh because Jesus is playing with these guys. It, it says that their eyes were kept from recognizing. He pulls up, and their tongue says, what are you guys talking about? Why such the long faces? Are you the only guy in Jerusalem that doesn't know what's happened? And Jesus says, what? Wouldn't that have been fun? No, tell me, what? What happened? So they get talking about this and they say, yeah, we thought Jesus was the Messiah, but, but they just killed him on Friday. But our, our women, the women uh, went to the tomb this morning and they saw angels and he said he's been raised from the dead. And then some of our own got up and ran to the tomb and saw it and found it just as the women had said. Well, wait a minute, Luke, just 12 verses earlier in 24, 12, you said it was just Peter that got up, and now you're saying some of our own, multiple people. What, what, are you contradicting yourself? You said just Peter, and Luke would say, no, I didn't say just Peter. I only mentioned Peter, but I didn't say only Peter went. Well, wait a minute, Luke. We don't do that in the 21st century today. So they did it in the first century, it appears, doesn't it? We have a couple of instances here where we can show that they were doing it then. And again, we have to judge them according to um, how they were writing according to to first century literary conventions, not 21st century. Listen, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John did not sit on a committee for the misleading of future historians. Point number two, the genre of the gospel. Genre means literary type. Now, there's all kinds of genre out there. For example, you turn on the evening news, it says, good evening, this is the evening news. Now, the genre that it's supposed to be, we're supposed to get a pithy, unbiased report of the world events of that day. Now, of course, we all know it doesn't matter what network we're watching. It might be pithy, but it is not unbiased. (laughs) But that's what it's supposed to be. And we know what we're getting, and and the intelligent person is going to be able to sift through some things and say, yep, 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 oh, that's a spin. It may be true, but it is a spin, and it may be false. Well, what about when you pick up a, a, a book and it says, once upon a time? Well, that, key, that gives us a clue. It says, what we're about to read is complete fiction. As soon as it says, once upon a time. What about movies? Well, there are degrees of historical authenticity. For example, it could say, based on a true story. What does that tell us? What we're about to view is almost identical to what happened. What if it says it's inspired by a true story? Well, that means the producers have taken a a degree of dramatic license there, right? Um, So that the actual people involved could watch that story and say, wow, that's a whole lot like what we were involved in. Well, what if it says, well, and then there's fiction. Now, remember a few years back, my family, we we got the DVD and we watched the movie uh, Rules of Engagement. 
It's a great movie, very exciting. And um, afterward, I, I got thinking about, well, what are these guys doing today? Because at the very end of the movie, it said, in this, the colonel retired honorably and went on to do this. And the attorney uh, got back into practice and gave up uh, alcohol, his alcohol, being an alcoholic and got control of that and went off and did this in this state. And I thought, wow, I wonder what they're doing today. So I looked it up online and I found that they're not doing anything because they never existed. So it had this degree of verisimilitude here where it presented it as though it were true, but it, it, it wasn't. Another movie, I hate to disappoint you with this, but um, Facing the Giants. <laughs> you know, I live in the Atlanta area and the church that produced this movie is like two, two and a half hours away from me in Georgia. And so watching that movie, I was just so inspired and so I decided, I wonder what that football team is doing now. And so I went online and I looked and I can't find the school anywhere, you know. And it's because it doesn't exist. <laughs> I was like, wow. Well, so we have these different degrees of historical authenticity. Well, what about when we come to the Gospels? What are we looking at? Well, of course, the average Christian's going to say, well, we've got these accounts that presents everything exactly how, they occur, how it occurred. And of course, the problem is then when they bring up uh, differences in the gospel, you say, exactly? Really? Well, what about this or this? Uh, did Jesus carry his cross all the way, like John says? Or did Simon of Cyrene come in and help him, like Matthew, Mark, and Luke say? And uh, did both thieves curse Jesus on the cross, like Mark says? Or did one say, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom, like Luke says? And you start to see these kinds of things. So um, we want to look at the Gospels as Greco-Roman biographies. And we find that this was a, um, a, a genre that, that looked at, to reporting history, but the authors, uh, various biographers, varied in their degrees of how accurate they were. For example, Aristobulus was an ancient biographer of Alexander the Great, and um, um, Plutarch reports in his biography of Alexander that when Aristobulus uh, presented his biography to uh, Alexander the Great, it was during a voyage, Alexander started reading it and then he took it and he threw it overboard and he said, Alex, Aristobulus, I'll throw you overboard after it because you've made up so many stories about me that are so fantastic that people won't believe the great things that I've done. So we know that Aristobulus took great liberties and invented stories. But then when, but biography changed over the years and that's the fourth century BC. By the time we get to the time of Jesus, there's like Suetonius, who's considered one of the two greatest um, uh, Roman historians and biographers. He writes in the beginning of the second century, and Plutarch, how do you like that name, Plutarch? You wanna name your son something someday? Plutarch. <laughs> um, so Plutarch, he's writing around the time of some of the Gospels are, are being written, and he's a Greco-Roman biographer, and he's very accurate, especially as we come closer to the time, the, the, the people live closer to, that he's writing on live closer to the time in, in which he lived. Now there were certain literary liberties involved. So for example, Ben Witherington, uh, whom you heard last night, he says, we must realize that ancient historians were not nearly so concerned as we are today about minute details. Often they were sa uh, satisfied with general rather than punctilious accuracy, so long as they presented the key points, thrust, and significance of a speech or event. How many of you are married? Okay, quite a few of you. All of you are gonna know what I'm talking about then when I talk about there's the guy version of a story and there's the girl version of the story. The guy version of the story is, is very bullet point, just get to the bottom line. The girl version of the story is give me all the details. It's not that one is wrong and the other is okay, it's just, I mean, they're just different, right? I mean, um, so they're just different. So, Let's look at these and how the Gospels work. I wanna look at different literary liberties. Chronology. We find Jesus uh, talking about the, or, or we find the Gospels reporting Jesus' temptation in the wilderness in both Matthew and Luke, turning bread in, or stones into bread because you're hungry after 40 days of fasting. Or throw yourself down from the pinnacle of the temple and angels will rescue you. Um, or uh, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world if you'll just worship and serve me. 
Well, we see that the order of the second and third temptations are inverted in one of the, the Gospels. Which one is how it actually occurred? Who knows? But the thing is here that it you know, they're not saying this is exactly what happened, happened in this order, didn't happen in the other order. A lot of times the gospel authors aren't too concerned about the precise chronological details. Another is time compression. Now, um, let's talk about, uh, <clears throat> you know, you got a couple of these happening, like uh, with the example of Jairus' daughter. Um, you'll have uh, Mark, he, he gives us the girl version of the story. It, it's a lot you know, uh, more detail involved, Matthew compresses it. So uh, Mark will say that Jairus came up to Jesus and said, uh, well, let's, let's look at what he says, because I have it here. Um, one of the synagogue officials named Jairus came up and on seeing Jesus fell at his feet and implored him earnestly saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she will get well and live. And he went off with him. They came from the house of the synagogue official saying, your daughter has died, why trouble the teacher anymore? But Jesus overhearing what was being spoken said to the synagogue official, do not be afraid any longer, only believe. And they went and he raised her. That's what, um, that, that's what Mark and Luke say. Now here's what Matthew says. A synagogue official came and bowed down before him and said, my daughter has just died but come and lay your hands on her and she will live. Jesus got up and began to follow him and so did his disciples. Well now Matthew and Luke say that what happened, she was still alive and then the servants came up and, and but Matthew just gives the boy version, of the, the guy version of the story and says look, I'm just cutting right to it, I, you know, for whatever reason, I don't wanna give all these different details. Now I know you ladies have problems with that because whenever, I know I'll be on the phone and I'll be talking to someone and recounting the story and my wife will say in the background, it didn't happen that way, you forgot this. And I'm saying, oh come on, he doesn't wanna hear about all that, I'm just getting to the bottom line. It's the guy version versus the girl version of the story. Matthew's just cutting right to it. What about the uh, cursing of the fig tree? We find this again. Now Mark gives us the girl version of the story again, that's his tendency. He's going to give us the details. How did things actually happen? Probably like Mark said over Matthew, because Matthew's doing the time compression. So it's the cursing of the fig tree. Here's what happens. Early in the morning, Jesus got up with his disciples and they went into Jerusalem. And on the way, they saw a fig tree and Jesus was hungry. So he went to see if there was fruit on it. There was no fruit on it, so he cursed it. And then they went into Jerusalem. At the end of the day, they went back to Bethany. The next day, they got up early in the morning and they were going back to Jerusalem and they saw the tree and it had withered and died. Now Matthew tells the guy version of the story. Early in the morning, they left Bethany, went to Jerusalem, no fruit, cursed it, it died. <laughs> There's no, and then they went in the next day, they came on and the next day, it just, no fruit only cursed it, it withered up immediately and died. It's not a contradiction, he's just time, it's time compression. He doesn't want to get into all the details, he's just getting to the bottom line. Now, this is brought up a lot of times, uh, the difference in the details with the resurrection narratives. One of the biggest one happens, occurs with the location of the first appearance in terms of to the, the group appearance and uh, where it happens. Now, Matthew suggests that it happens days later and it's in Galilee, whereas Luke says it's that day, it's Easter, and it's in Jerusalem. In fact, Luke says the resurrection occurred, all the appearances occurred, and um, the ascension occurred on Easter. So which was it? You know, did he stay for a period of time uh, and appear to them over a period of time and in Galilee, or did it all happen in Jerusalem on Easter? Well, probably over a period of time in the first group appearance was in Galilee. Um, and, and what happens is Luke does the time compression and puts it all on Easter um, in order to save space or either to emphasize that the church um, is going to be based out of Jerusalem. Well, how do we know that Luke isn't just contradicting the others? Well, there's a good, uh, a very strong indicator of this because Luke wrote a sequel to his gospel, the Acts of the Apostles, which is the uh, history of the first three uh, uh, decades of the church. And in chapter one, he says that Jesus appeared to them over a period of 40 days. So Luke knows that it happened over a period of time. So 
I, I think we can be pretty confident that that's what he was doing in his gospel, time compression. Narrative flow, narrative flow. It's not like it is today. Um, now, I, I mentioned how biography evolved over time. One of the first uh, biographers, um, Vero around the year 125 BC, and he basically was an antiquarian. It's kind of like, let's just write these things down as though we're journaling them. Let's just write it down. There's no narrative to it. You're just gonna list the events that happened in this person's life. A little bit later, there's a guy named uh, Salust, and he says, well, no, that antiquarian view is kind of dull and boring. Now, we want to be dry in pre presenting a biography because that way we're detached but we want it to be highly politicized. We want there to be an agenda behind this to, to using a political view. Cicero comes along a little later in the first century BC and he says, well, we, we want it to be highly politicized, but we don't want it to be dry. It's gotta be a really nice artistic narrative that moves along. And then by the time you get into the first century, there's a guy named Plutarch. And Plutarch says, no, we wanna write biography. It needs to be nice in its narrative flow. It needs to be really good in a sense and entertaining for readers. But the primary objective of a biography is not to be politicized, it's to show a person's character, the good and bad points of their character. And he's the one writing around the same time as the Gospels are writing. Now, as far as we know, there's only one treatment or one that has survived from antiquity on how they wrote history. And its title is How to Write History <laughs> by a guy named Lucian in the middle of the second century. And here's what he writes. All the body of the history is simply a long narrative. So let it be adorned with the virtues proper to narrative, progressing smoothly, evenly, and consistently, free from humps and hollows. Then let its clarity be limpid, achieved, as I have said, both by diction and the interweaving of the matter. For he will make everything distinct and complete, and when he has finished the first topic, he will introduce the second, fastened to it and linked with it like a chain to avoid breaks and a multiplicity of disjointed narratives. No, always the first and second topics must not be merely neighbors, but have common matter and overlap. So it is an artistic put together to join these narratives, these stories together. What's that gonna mean? It's gonna mean sometimes that when we see in the text it says this happened next and then this happened, they're gonna do this for links, but it may not have happened in that precise order. Now, let's look at a couple examples of this within the Gospels. Mary anointing Jesus. She comes in, she breaks a vial of perfume open, pours it on him, and, and, then, and then wipes it with her hair. Well, uh, if we read in the Gospel of John, it happens prior to Palm Sunday, but when we read it in Matthew and Mark, it happens after Palm Sunday. Well, which was it? If we take this in a very wooden sense, we have a contradiction. But understanding how ancient biographers would write, not so much concerned with chronology as we saw a little bit earlier, um, and things gotta be linked together, the link here when it comes to John is John had just told the story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. He hasn't mentioned Mary and Martha at that point. And so John, again, now the Gospels, uh, synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, bring Mary and Martha up earlier, they're mentioned in their Gospels, but John hasn't mentioned them yet. He mentions the raising of Lazarus from the dead, and you think, oh, okay, well, we've just mentioned the raising of Lazarus, uh, Lazarus. we've seen Mary and Martha, ah, oh, I got a story I wanna tell you about Mary. And he brings it up, but he's talking about as though it's in chron chronolo chrono chronologically at, at that point prior to Palm Sunday when an, in actuality it happened afterward. But he's linking them together. Now some today might have problems with that, but again, we've got to look at how the Gospels or the literary conventions of the first century, not those of the 21st century. They, they weren't so concerned as we are with some of these insignificant details. What about when Jesus, when, uh, Jesus predict, or tells Peter he's gonna deny him? Well, according to Matthew and Mark, it occurred on the Mount of Olives, but according to Luke and John, it happens in the upper room before going to the Mount of Olives. Well, which was it? I don't know. I have no idea in this one. But for the gospel authors, they just didn't, it didn't matter. They wanted to get the story in at some point and they just put it in, plopped it in along the narrative at some point. For them, this, nobody would have considered this a contradiction back then. Um, they're just not concerned about the, uh, the precise uh, arrangement of the details at that point. 
Um, I'll tell you what, because of lack of time. Gosh, and this is a, a neat one. Well, let me just go through this. Stumbling block to children. Here's what Matthew, this is where Jesus talks about, um, you know, don't cause one of these little ones to stumble. Matthew 18, one through six. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and said, who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called a child to himself and set him before them and said, truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, um, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a heavy milestone, millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. When we read the same story in Luke, this happens right after telling the story about the rich man and Lazarus. And Luke then has Jesus, reports Jesus saying the following. I mean, this is the context. Right after reporting about the rich man and Lazarus, um, uh, Luke says, Jesus said to his disciples, it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come, but woe to him through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea that he would cause one of these little ones to stumble. One of what little ones? He hasn't mentioned anything about pulling a, a child in front of him and talking or the disciples asking him questions. The context, again, he's just talked about the rich man and Lazarus. This just is pulled in. Luke wants to get the story in and he brings this in. He's obviously aware of the story that is told in the other gospels in Matthew because he's mentioning the little ones which he doesn't mention in his narrative. So we could see that they could pop a story in at some point. It doesn't have to be chronologically at the same time. Okay, photo or portrait. And, and what I've done is I've gone from the, the most insignificant differences in the Gospels, and then I, I show more significant, and now we're getting into the rather significant differences in the Gospels. A photograph, if I were to take a photograph of, let's say, Chris Shannon, my friend who's sitting right there. Now, if I took a photograph of him right now, it would be very accurate, talking about you know, what your hair color is and about your age and what clothes you were wearing and there were people around you and, it, and you've got name tags on, and it, so you must be at some kind of conference. So it would tell me some minor details, but it may not tell me what conference he's at or what he's do, doing here or where this is at. Um, in antiquity as well as even later on and even sometimes today, when you paint a portrait of a person, you may put details in that portrait that aren't necessarily accurate for that particular period of time. Like uh, in the Renaissance days, you might have a person standing by a window, which would seem to suggest that the person was an, a businessman. Or maybe you'd put a dog in the picture to show that the guy's character, or the woman's character, they were faithful. Or maybe you'd paint a scene, a battle going on in a hill in the background. Now, of course, that's not happening at that point. Whoa, wait a minute, whoa, boy, that arrow was close. <laughs> Um, that's not going on at that time, but it's there to paint the picture that, that that guy was in the military, okay? So that's a portrait. It may not have the precise accuracy that a photograph is going to have, but it's going to communicate more about the character of that person. Well, which are the Gospels? Well, they're both. And uh, Gospels like John have more of a portrait, they do more of the portrait at times than the synoptics do. Let me just give you an example of this, but this comes from Matthew's uh, gospel. Now, sometimes we talk about the difference in the genealogy between Matthew and Luke. I'm not thinking about that. I'm thinking about Matthew's genealogy versus the genealogies as presented in the Old Testament. Matthew says in chapter one, verse 17, so all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. So you have 14, 14, 14. But when you compare Matthew's genealogy with what we find in the Old Testament, in the Chronicler, we find that the Chronicler includes four additional uh, uh, g uh, generations that Matthew doesn't list. And yet Matthew says this is all of them. Well, what, what's the deal there? And why the 14, 14, 14? That's, that's kind of interesting. Well, we really don't know for certain, but a, years ago, a few years back there were two uh, New Testament scholars uh, who proposed an idea that a lot of scholars now accept and even evangelical scholars accept. Um, and they say that what Matthew was doing here is using um, a Hebrew idiom called gematria. And what gematria did was it assigned a numerical value to, to letters. 
And so what you have here um, is you got this 14, 14, 14, and when you put that together, you come up with the name Dawid or David. Could it be then that Matthew intentionally omitted four generations in order to tell the readers that Jesus is the son of David? Not a contradiction if that's what he's doing, because remember in biography, you're painting a portrait at times you have the ability to paint a portrait, the freedom to do that over having uh, pictorial accuracy. The Gospel of John, um, there's a, a, a conservative scholar who wrote the following, what Shakespeare does by dramatic insight, and it may be added, what many a preacher does by homiletical skill, all this and much more, the Spirit of God accomplished in our evangelist, the author of John's Gospel. It does not take divine inspiration to provide a verbatim transcript, but to reproduce the words which were spirit and life to their first believing hearers in such a way that they continue to communicate their saving message and prove themselves to be spirit and life to men and women today, 19 centuries after John wrote, that is the work of the Spirit of God. Now he's writing this because he says that you have Plutarch report the, the assassination of Julius Caesar and what happens to the assassins afterward. He says that Shakespeare takes some liberties, dramatic license with that, and, and, and puts some things in there, changes the story a little bit to make it more dramatic. And, he's, and this conservative scholar says that that's what John does in his reports of Jesus at times to what the synoptics are reporting. Who was this author, this scholar? F.F. F. Bruce. And where do we see this? Do we see this happening in the Gospel of John at times? I think we do. Uh, let me just give a cup of that. Um, in drinking the cup, this is one that bothered me for a while until I understood a little what John was doing. In Mark, it says, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. It's pretty much the same thing in Matthew, pretty much the same thing in Luke. But when we come to John, Jesus says, now my soul has become troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this purpose, I came to this hour. What? In the synoptics, you want out of this. And now you're saying, should I ask to be delivered? No, I, was, I came for this. Jesus says to Peter, put the sword into the sheath, the cup which the Father has given me, shall I not drink it? It's a little bit different than what we find in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Seems like a contradiction. But not if we understand that John is painting a portrait of Jesus here. And the, the bottom line is, if we were to summarize this, the synoptic gospels report that Jesus struggled with taking the cup, asked God to spare him if at all possible. When he learned that it was not possible, he submitted to God's will and willingly accepted it. In John, Jesus was more interested in the purpose of his coming than being spared from a brutal death. So he submitted himself to God's will and willingly accepted it. Just like Hebrews says, Jesus for the joy set before him endured the cross and despised its shame. It's not a contradiction, it's just John has brushed out. He, hasn't, he doesn't report the struggle that Jesus had, he's just getting to the bottom line. Jesus submitted himself to the will of God and went to the cross for our sake. I have to, to skip some of this because I'm, I'm pretty much out of time with this. I want to take a couple of questions. Finally, the third uh, point, historical value of contradictions. What if all of this is wrong that I'm saying? And we really have contradictions in the Gospels. What does that mean? Well, I mentioned the, the Titanic to you a little bit earlier. They contradicted on whether she broke in half. Um, the bottom line is that even when the eyewitnesses contradicted one another on this, nobody turned around and said, well, I guess the Titanic didn't sink. They just said that there was a peripheral detail that we just don't know the answer to. And then they found out when they discovered the Titanic in the 1980s that she had indeed broken in, in half before sinking. Um, but it didn't mean the Titanic didn't sink. So you could have maybe some differences in the Gospels in terms of was there one angel, were there two? Did Jesus carry his cross all the way or did Simon of Cyrene? Nobody really disputes whether Jesus was crucified. Um, so uh, again, it, it, it doesn't really, wouldn't mean the tomb wasn't empty. Um, it would just mean we, we don't know on some of these things. That's the worst case scenario. It doesn't mean that the Gospels are disqualified as historical or reliable sources. Um, I gotta skip some other examples here. Basic, uh, uh, the, the bottom line, we gotta ask, is it a contradiction or a difference? The genre of the Gospels, the Greco-Roman biographies are within that genre uh, uh, as most are agreeing today. 
Um, but we, we certainly see that they are taking liberties. Maybe sometimes we don't take those here in the 21st century, although I gotta tell you, there are liberties taken in 21st century biographies and quoting people and, and summarizing stories. And we must judge the Gospels according to first century rather than 21st century standards, how they wrote back then. And finally, differences in the peripherals do not challenge the historicity of an event. I got time for about two or three questions, depending on how long they are. Yes, sir. And also, if they, uh, you don't believe so, why would they include contradictions? If I don't, uh, I, I, yes, I, I do, well, I think John is certainly independent of the synoptic gospels. Uh, Matthew and Mark, um, I mean, there's different hypotheses. I, I, at this point, I believe Matthew and Mark, Matthew and Luke know Mark, and they use him as one of their sources. Your second question was? Well, if they did use each other's sources, why would they include contradictions? Uh, what I'm proposing here is they aren't contradictions. Um, they were just literary uh, freedoms, that, uh, a license that they had back then that they could take in order to make certain points. So they wouldn't have regarded them as contradictions. Yes, sir. Hello, hello. Uh, was there really a boy in the feeding of the 5,000? Was there a what? Like in the, when Jesus feeds the 5,000 or whatever, was there really a boy who gave the two fish and the bread? Was there really a boy who came up and gave fish uh, uh, and, and bread to uh, Jesus and the disciples in the feeding of the 5,000? I, I would have no reason to, uh, to doubt that. Yes, uh, don't worry about it, he can, well, okay. Bruce. Uh, when you, when you use the uh, Greco-Roman uh, biographies as uh, the identification of the genre of the Gospels, some people object to that and say that the Gospels are a genre of their own, and often that means that there are theological issues that are built into that identification of the genre. So why do you prefer uh, to use the Greco-Roman biographies as your model? Uh, and I suppose there are two different audiences there. There's a skeptical audience that you're addressing, and then of course there's the problem of addressing the church itself. Okay, well when we look at, in, in the Gospels, we would see different genres even within the Gospels, like parables. Well, how do we know they're parables? Um, and some of them are, are eas more easily identified than others. What about the rich man in Lazarus where it says, you know, the rich man in hell is in hell and Lazarus in his, Abraham's bosom. You know, some, uh, uh, the majority of people regard that as a parable, but some will say, no, it's not a parable because parables typically don't mention names and you got Lazarus mentioned there. So there, there's room for dispute there. But I, I don't think, you know, it's gonna be any problem if, we, if someone says, well, that's a parable, you, you, you know, uh, what we're looking at there. Um, Proverbs, we don't read those literally like in Proverbs 8 that there's an actual thing called wisdom standing there on the rooftop and crying out, you know, uh, all the naive and simpletons come and learn from me, things like this. Um, so the, the same thing, we, we look at the Gospels to try to figure out what's the best way of understanding these. Now maybe they are a unique genre, some still hold to that. Um, back in the 1980s though, and even the 90s, you had the Jesus Seminar saying, yes, they're a sui generis, they're a unique genre, and they're mythical. Now some Christians would say, yes, they're unique genre, but um, they're absolutely historical. Um, but you still have to account for some of these differences. And these things are easily accounted for by ancient biography. But if you're not gonna take it as biography, well, then you've got these stark differences, some of which are going to be impossible to harmonize. Again, in order to do that, you're gonna to have to subject the text to that hermeneutical waterborne and until it tells you what you wanna hear. Um, I just don't think that's a responsible treatment of the text. Uh, you know, God can still inspire through ancient biography um, and, and get, you know, for us to understand what he's trying to communicate. Thank you so much. Um, I will remain here if you wanna ask any questions. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.